Welcome to another Café Oralist, another opportunity for me to directly interact with someone I've been chatting with a bit online and I uh, was hoping to meet at Dragon Meet last year, but it didn't happen. Uh, Eric, could you introduce yourself to our viewers? Yes, I didn't make it to Dragon Meet last year, <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm um, Eric Newdon. I never know if I should say New Dan or New Dan with a French accent. Uh, now you get both. Uh, I've been a writer and designer of games for the last, what, 20 odd years. Worked in France um, for different publishers. And now I'm, I'm doing my own thing, working on my own other things, uh, real life uh, jobs, and also designing my own little games. Awesome. And I live in, in Ireland. Awesome. For people who are either following already the, the Rollis podcast or uh, who are curious, uh, in in the episode I recorded in Dragon Meat, there was a moment uh, during the recording when I confused you with somebody else. Actually, I confused three people at once. So I met Ursi Dice, who's a fellow Briton from uh, Croydon, I think. And uh, I confused him with you. So I asked him, oh, so you're, you're a French designer from Ireland. And he was like, I'm not French, no, no, I, no, from Ireland. And it seems that I had confused you with Elucubration Ursidae, who is a blogger, who I don't know quite well. And then I confused that person with Ursidae. But uh, yeah, you can, people can go check our Dragon Meat episode uh, 2019 part two if, uh, if they're curious about this. Rather an uninteresting idea <laughs> story. So uh, the, the big name I know you from is uh, Macchiato Monsters, which I haven't played yet. So what can you tell us you about that? So it was my attempt to do something in the old school uh, OSR uh, kind of uh, design space. Uh, I'd been falling more and more deeper and deeper into into OSR games. Um, first, I think through nostalgia, because I have like, like they're never very far uh, away from me. I have my old red boxes uh, from when I was a kid, uh, when I started uh, playing games and I've never stopped since then. Uh, and I think like everyone who went into OSR, you start because, oh, Remember that time when we were afraid of going to dungeons and we were just dwarves and elves and it wasn't uh, complicated and it was just about survival. Uh, you start like this and then you find out that the uh, gameplay is entirely different. And um, then if you're a bit on the design side and a lot of OSR people are, you start making your little, uh, little rules and then you bring stuff from your own sensibility uh, or sensitivity of your own the, the old rules you like uh, so in the end uh, i end up with this Maybe i have it's always it's never very far uh, it's like 64 pages of uh, every no sorry 54 pages pages of everything you need to make uh, your own campaign with uh, very basic rules and a lot of uh, input from the players as well because that's what i like uh, I, I'm a, I'm a lazy uh, dungeon master. I like it when players decide to play an elf or a cleric tell me what the gods are like and where elves come from so that I don't have to do it myself. I love the design. I'm, uh, I just got in touch with a, an artist for uh, my first own game that I'm designing today. Oh. And uh, yeah, I love a coffee, my, my Keto Monster. I think as soon as you see it, the, the branding, the, the visual, it, it sort of grabs you. Uh, uh, when I saw it, I, I I haven't played it yet again, but uh, it just wired in my mind. I would remember it all my my life that oh, this game, this coffee inspired game. It's entirely accidental, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Like the idea of the name came from sidelines, thinking out of the box, uh, because I was hacking from the Black Hack, which you may know, which is a famous. Um, a very simple third wave uh, old school uh, games rules engine and white hack which is an older one so i was putting a little bit of white in my black hack so at the beginning was the i think i called it the latte hack first and then zebra and then you ended up like yellow monsters because i like alliterations alliteration is awesome so just <laughs> before we we started 
tiny little bit late because we were into a conversation before starting the recording. And uh, part of our conversation was um, trying to, not exactly categorize, but I guess it, it's uh, find the, the right tools to to communicate with one another of whether a tabletop role-playing game is oriented towards narration, tactical slash simulation, or uh, the ludist side, the, the gamey side. So where would you s think you would sit with uh, Macchiato Monsters? Um, hmm. It's hard to say because, as we were saying, it's very difficult to categorize uh, until we get to a system that has 27,000 uh, different categories and then you can put all 27,000 different games each into its own one. Um, I think Macchiato Monsters is... It's old school in the sense that um, it's going to be very uh, immersive and it's going to be very simple. As a, as a player, you don't think in ways of systems and you don't look at your character sheet to solve problems. You look at the fiction. Uh, and if you're looking at your character sheet, it's to, it, it's to look at, oh, I have an, an extra bit of string that I could use to make a trap to maybe cut catch the goblin who will convince to uh, uh, let us talk to the goblin king so we can finally go kill all the orcs that we need to kill but we don't we can't really do it because we're just level one dudes with a half a sword between us uh, so that's that's what really inspired me but then i had to uh it, it happened organically over three years plus of design i had to add uh, random tables that will give me ideas and then little systems and little questions and answers um, rules that will let players uh, add what they want into the game. Random, like. ta random tables are... Th there was a recent episode of a French... I think we got a, a couple of French uh, speakers in the chat room. There was a recent episode of Voix uh dedicated to, uh, yep. to random tables. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was very good and very instructive. I especially enjoyed when they started talking about... I, I always find it interesting in debates. The debates tend to be, is this good or bad? Is this replacing this or that? And they were talking about, uh, oh, do you have the map of the whole city? And each house is described and who are you going to find it? find in there i guess something a bit like uh, i remember night prowler was slightly like that uh, the, some of the supplements uh, or the opposite you don't have a town you have a system to generate the map of the town and you you randomly roll absolutely everything and what i thought was the most interesting is when you have a mix of the two you've got a different table for different neighborhoods and sort of the tables are like well this is a table for the fancy neighborhood so you are much more likely to run into a wealthy merchant and this is a table for at night so it's not it's not sometimes random tables are described as, as absolutely completely random despite their like algorithms you you predefine settings of what they're, they're gonna work like yeah they're not even if they are uh even if you're mixing uh wealthy merchants and uh, undead zombies and uh, flying gnomes uh it will still generate an environment that will be unique and yeah it will be a very very strange part of the city but it's the, it's the place where sometimes you run into fine gnomes and uh, they're running after zombies so I, I jumped into because we had our conversation before i jumped into uh talking game design but normally i have a, a couple ice breaking questions uh, which i didn't ask you yet uh in this time of COVID 19 what, what is your routine like if it's not indiscreet no, it's not. Um, I don't have one. <laughs> I'm afraid. That's a way I to approach it. To have, yeah, I, no, I try to have one, but I, I can't stick uh, to it. I try to get up early-ish, uh, so seven. Uh, ideally, I would wake up at six, but um, the thing that goes, that's, that, that is a priority is uh, sleep. I try to sleep eight hours because otherwise I don't function. And I get uh, bad migraines like uh, this morning. That's why I, I apologize if I'm a bit uh, blurry. I'm full of meds. Uh, and um, what I try to do is work every morning, uh, take a walk or go onto my skateboard for an hour. Um, 
often it's mid mid afternoon because I push things back. Uh, and yeah, night is about reading or playing games. Uh, just a, a, a tiny little thing. Uh, some other people advised me to do that, but I, I forgot. Could you go into your audio settings? You know, you, when you went to your mic and untick automatically adjust volume on your microphone. I think it's gonna work. Yes. Better. Um, um, what was I about to say? Yeah, and uh, yeah, routine. It's a funny thing because uh, here uh, I've been. Uh, it's my ninth. It's a week number nine of self-containment because we, uh, we started a bit earlier here. And for a while I was like, I need a routine, I need a routine. And now I've achieved a routine, but I'm at the stage when I'm getting bored of my routine. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's kind of getting depressing. You're going through those stages and yeah, it's uh, emotionally, it's it's kind of, it comes and goes uh, rather swiftly. Yeah, early, uh, early in the... Um in the lockdown, I think we've only been seven weeks here, maybe eight with the people who, uh, who uh, took ahead, uh, decided to work from home uh, one week ahead because they knew it was coming. Um, I read a very good article about, uh, by, by an academic who um, had several per uh, periods in her life where she was uh, in war zones or uh, in difficult situations and she still had to work. Um, and she said uh, something that stuck with me from the beginning. It's your brain is going to adapt and uh, it's survival mode and you need to put a lot of systems back in place because your relationships are different. Um, some people are, are, are uh, at risk in your immediate family or community. Uh, some people are able to provide support. Maybe it's you, maybe you're the one who needs support. So you're going to need a, a few weeks to get this and then creativity will come back. Uh, and it might not stay with you from then. It might go again three weeks later because things change and you're basically grieving. Uh, so, um, yeah, I've bookmarked that article and I, I come back to it every time I feel like, fuck, I can't think of anything when I'm in front of my computer in the morning. I guess it, it reminds, uh, I don't know what it's called, but the sort of pyramid, I guess it's called the pyramid of needs. You know, like the, the first mm -hmm. need you need, it's safety, <laughs> a sense yeah. of safety, then being fed, sleep, and, and then being fulfilling. Uh, I guess when you enter a crisis like that, if we go right to the top of the, the pyramid, uh, to care about our safety, and then uh, we go holding some toilet paper and food, and and then so, so only after that we we get into the the creative mode. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 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 quite an experience. And someone kicked the pyramid. Yes, someone came and kicked the pyramid, so we have to rebuild it. Yeah, and the the, the thing is, I think because it's it's based on isolation, there's at the one point there's this notion of repetition. You know, uh, it's when you achieve the stability, I guess you can achieve a bit of um, entertain yourself, you know, diversify your experience daily through creativity. But at some point, if you stay inside uh, and you uh, you have just online conversation, which which is uh, already uh, very helpful, at least in my case, you yeah. you reach a point when you are ah, actually I need to change I need to shake the routine somehow I need to to change things because it's it's getting too repetitive, and uh, this is becoming a source of stress uh, in itself. No, yeah. and you have a young kid as well, uh, and for for them routine is like the most important thing. Well, on one hand, I'm lucky because he's only two years old, so I I don't think he processes. I think the world. Uh, including our apartment and we're lucky to have a, a playground which is not uh, frequented by a lot of people so we, we can go there quite safely uh, at first it's not close and then we've got a, a much larger park which we can explore uh, but uh, so i think his world is big enough for him but it's more for us when yeah that's when you realize how much uh child care <laughs> professionals nurseries and so on such a massive work they're doing and uh and uh, yeah, yeah the 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 situation for us is uh yeah we we somewhat fu almost fully dedicated to him and to, to my wife who's working from home but 
if if my wife takes some time off uh it falls on me or if i take some time off it falls on her so the 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 leg room is extremely extremely limited and uh, yeah you were talking about relationship with people uh it was it was quite a test of relationship to to find a new balance uh in the way we we are doing things uh, at home uh, and so on and uh yeah, it was a bit rough uh, after week three or something like that. Yeah. Did you pick up any new skills or hobby while self-contained? <laughs> no. Again, I had lots of plans, and I was thinking I would be super good at doing yoga every morning, and uh, I haven't. Uh, even meditation, which is something I've been doing for years, I thought I would be able to stick to a even a 10 minute a day after my shower thing haven't happened um, what i'm finding is that um, instead of consuming a, a lot of um, science fiction tv shows and reading comics and um, uh, i don't know we are watching uh, uh, actual play videos i'm finding that i want to dedicate that time to more culture so i, I uh, looked for ebooks and uh, audiobooks and um, yeah f further away than my very focused nerdy uh taste uh and that feels kind of good like it feels like evading when you're listening to you know, 16th century poetry or stuff like that feels nice to open the field i yeah i don't have the uh emotional availability to to dig myself in some some good novels or i, I think the last quotation mark uh what do you call that uh boutique cinema uh, movie i saw was uh um parasite uh but uh uh, something I really enjoy is watching um, some um, video essays on YouTube, uh, like the one by the nerd writer, uh, which who is very very good at doing not too long videos on a specific topic, and it can be a a poem by Emily Dickinson or uh, Darth Vader for us more nerdy mm -hmm. people. That, like you find out that, that I think it's Darth Vader appears for 35 minutes in the whole original trilogy is, is actually barely there. So he goes through yeah. uh, the numbers of it and then the visual aspects and how oh, they are different in Empire Strikes Back compared to A New Hope and then Return of the Jedi. And But just just even visually, not, not even in terms of narration or in terms of, um, the of course, the, the iconic uh, soundscapes of Darth Vader, just oh the the figure works uh visually and it's it's quite cool when you you got stuff like that to then think of oh, how could i include that in one description of a, a villain in a role-playing game or something like that yeah i didn't know i, I wrote that down because uh youtube is a big problem to me like I can't, I can't seem to live without it uh but i can very rarely find something that i really want to see and you keep you know pushing in my face stuff that uh, it thinks uh, I will find interesting and I don't because, you know, at some point I was looking for one subject and uh, uh, now it's all uh, it keeps me, it can send to me. Um, I will send you stuff old... more frequently on on on, uh, on Twitter. We can exchange because I've been starting yeah. a couple others now, which uh, I quite enjoyed. And when I watch those things, I'm, I'm sort of always frustrated that uh, Sometimes my wife is interested and check them out and then we talk about it, but I don't really have that many people I know with who I can discuss the content of the video and it's something uh, I'm really keen to do because you're like, oh, oh, what did you think about that part? Uh, the fact that uh, I watched one recently about how Mad Max Fury Road, again, somewhat quite, still quite geeky. Uh, oh no, another one I watched recently was about um, stories in which the character don't change. So the, the oh, stories exactly. stories with characters who technically don't have an arc, and they, they explain yeah. how the thing of those characters is that it's the world around them who, who changes due to to what they do. So the examples it took three examples, including a movie I, I really want to check out now. Uh, the first one was it was a sort of reviewing in parallel uh, Paddington Two, so with the little bear. 
Back to the Future <laughs> okay. with Marty, and the last one is called The Trotsky. Uh, I never heard of that movie. It seems quite recent, mm -hmm. in which you got yeah, a. Yeah, it's a student who uh, is convinced that he's the uh, reincarnation of Leon Trotsky, and uh, okay. and yeah, he does stuff in his high school, and uh, the 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 few extracts he show uh, seems. Uh, Quite, quite fascinating for uh, a crypto Marxist like me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, it was a few years ago. Uh, it was Robin D. Laws on the podcast he does with uh, with Ken Hyde, uh, and they were talking about the Batman trilogy, uh, the um, Christopher Nolan one. And they were arguing that you don't need to give an arc to Batman because he's Batman. <laughs> Uh, and like there's a lot of superheroes who have backstories and who grow and go to trouble if you think about Spider-Man. Uh, but you also have these very monolithic characters that are there to do one thing and they shouldn't be changing from in, in the, the space of one hour and 45 minutes. It's funny because uh, in the should... video, he, he concluded the video by just seeing uh, s s sort of as a, something a bit out of the box, but he seemed very emotional saying it. He said, um, he said uh, at the end of his video, he said, and um, that's how you should do a Superman movie. And then he gets the video, <laughs> like uh, apparently frustrated with uh, how Superman's been treated as a character in the last few yeah. uh, movies. But um, you can, you could argue, I'm just thinking about that now, and I'm probably very wrong, and we're probably going to get a lot of comments. Uh, you know what? It's good. I've been saying that in another video. I found out that actually steering the pot is the only thing which brings you visibility. So if you have something <laughs> okay. horrendous to say, go ahead, say it. And then maybe no, people don't... will pay notice to what we say. I'm, I'm wondering, is that the reason why uh, the Marvel movies work so well? Uh, is that because the characters, most of the characters are established and uh, especially like in the Avengers movies, you don't have time to spend on any of the 12 characters that you have there. Uh, and they're, they're just there to do their bit. Um, and it feels more like a superhero story to me than the horrible stuff we've had for 50 years before um, Iron Man. You, did, you didn't like uh, Batman 89, for instance, or personally even Batman, Batman Returns, I quite enjoyed it. Um, 89 oh, yeah. is uh, the, the, the Tim Burton, right? Yeah, yeah. Or even the X-Men. I, I really enjoyed the first two X-Men. I think now they yeah. got a, a bad rep because of all the, f all the stuff which followed. But I don't think there would be a Marvel Cinematic Universe without X-Men and X-Men 2. Or... No, I think X-Men worked like there's a... You can see the special effects even at the time were a bit uh, sad and lacking. But um, the first X-Men I've seen quite a few times and I really like the fact that they give you an in into the, into the world of the X-Men. They don't try and start at the beginning with the stuff that they that, that they've done afterwards, uh, explain the school and etc. They put Rogue in there, uh, and uh, she's our our point of view character, and she gets into this world. And since she's just this tiny young woman, and she can't be uh, obviously at the time, she cannot be the protagonist. Uh, then you put Wolverine, and uh, you have to have, like your two uh, your your two characters uh, that give you the in into the, the X world, if I can say that. And then it goes into uh, Magneto trying to uh, change the world, etc., etc. So you, but you were saying, uh, so you, Iron Man for you, it's, uh, well, kind of obviously, it's, it's a game changer really for you. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I'm not a specialist and that's on a movie that I've seen many, many times, but it's, it's the first real at least as a as a former fan of Marvin comics, because I was reading them when I was younger, uh, it felt like we had finally had a, a proper superhero movie. But what I find is nice with the MCU, and I disliked with uh, most of the the latest uh, DC universe one, is that uh, there's sort of this take of 
making the world seem real, but on the same time they yeah. that, they're not they're not embarrassed about themselves because sometimes I find the DC stuff, the the people working on it, they feel like. It sounds like they're, they're embarrassed of the concept of Superman or they're embarrassed of the concept of Batman and they, they really feel very hard like turning, taking a step away, stand next to the viewer, look towards their own creation and say, ah, it's a bit ridiculous, right? And and and, and they, they're shy of, of doing the... Yeah, of being a bit more faithful and colorful. I think that's something which from which the X-Men suffered also uh, past number two uh, they, they never owned uh, literally the colors of the characters you know if I think if uh, Wolverine shows up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in a, in a few movies I'm pretty sure it will be at least there will be good patches of yellow in his costume and not, not just at the end of the movie and then we forget about it like in the Wolverine it's uh, it will be bright because the characters are bright. Captain America is blue, white, and red, and Iron Man is yet bright yellow and red. Yeah, I think it's a it's a different time probably, and yeah, they were they were probably afraid uh, of putting people in in spandex and having them look stupid. Um, I don't know what these all these costumes that we see in the Avengers movie look like when you're in front of them. <laughs> Probably they not have that the good. Means to, to make them look good and cool. So um... it's quite uh, interesting also to see uh, the learning curve they got there, and it, it was quite cool in a in a hand game to see them go back to the first Avenger movie and and yeah. in that case be a bit like uh, Captain America is like is my favorite superhero. Uh, there's a lot of uh, contradiction in in me picking that one, uh, to be honest. But uh, it, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it, the the evolution of the costume of Captain America is is very interesting. Oh, it became more and more subtle uh, as they went. Uh, and uh, yeah, the least favorite is definitely the one from the first Avenger movie. Mm. Have you have you ever tried? Because I find it's a weird animal to run a superhero story with role playing games because we tend to to balance out character, balance level of powers, and so on. And uh, I find it interesting that actually in a superhero movie you need to to large extent overlook that because it doesn't make much sense. A squirrel girl can defeat Doom, and and uh, yeah, the character as as strong as the narration requires them to do so if you you start uh, to, to create your character with a point system and uh, oh if you are that strong that means you are that stupid and so on uh, I, I don't find it works uh, that way in role playing game that, that's why uh, long story short my favorite system is masks a new generation I think that that's the only superhero game which really cracked that that nut uh, at least the one uh, the one I played I don't know if you tried it and if you if yeah, if there are games <laughs> I've played Masks uh, maybe three sessions. We tried a mini campaign that uh, in the end, it was working for me, but uh, it was online. So I don't know exactly uh, who was dissatisfied with it, but uh, the games master, the MC, uh, in the end said that uh, it wasn't working and uh, he was going to, to start something else, uh, which I didn't uh, play. I can't remember what that was. It was like a a pickup group around the Google Plus at the time. Remember that blessed time when uh, uh, everyone was talking with everyone about games? So we, we ended up playing with uh, all designers of around the world and uh, play testing their games. And uh, you mean one time for uh, me? For me, that time is now. <laughs> I'm playing more games than I ever did, and I'm playing with people I never played with. So <laughs> I cannot complain for, at the moment. For, for me, it was Google Plus. Uh, I still play a lot, uh, especially now, <laughs> in the last couple of months. But uh, I'm still within the same uh, the same groups that I that I actually play with uh, in the mid space. So you actually that reminds me uh, when I first well not not first first but I remember interviewing uh, what's his family name. I don't know, but Paolo from Lost Pages uh, on the yeah. uh, in, at Dragon Meet a couple of years ago, 
and I, I believe we we talked about you briefly, and he mentioned uh, th wasn't didn't you meet and part of the reason Makato Monster came out at Lost Pages isn't related to a big uh, meat space uh, being uh, in between slice and called uh, Lasagna Con? Yes. Uh, he, he's been doing that every summer for like six years now. It's basically inviting people to uh, his flat in Glasgow. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, and play games for a weekend and cook a lot of lasagna beforehand so that we fed everyone, feed everyone uh, for three days. By the by, the Sunday night, no one wants lasagna anymore. <laughs> I can tell you. We're happy to go to the chipper and get some uh, some uh, deep fried uh, haggis. I think you could uh, make a bucket list of uh, food team convention because I, f I believe there's burrito con as well. I think there's, there's yeah. at least a third one name uh, as a as a, a condiment or, or something. Yeah. I went to one in France once that was hot dog themed, uh, and they had uh, a menu of increasingly big. Uh, and heavy and uh, gross, <laughs> to be honest, uh, hot dogs. And the last one, I guess, uh, I I think you you got a prize if you finish it. It was like a, a whole oh <laughs> a whole a whole baguette with uh, twenty sausages in it, and uh, yeah, it was terrible. It's never very healthy, or at least doesn't sound like. Yeah, well, it was it was uh, yeah French gamers in the nineties or or two thousands probably two thousands. So, what are you working on uh, at the moment? Are you developing a new game? I also saw uh, that you're you're actually part of a, a business called Desks and Dragons. Do you want to uh, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, um, Desks and Dragons is actually my retirement plan because uh, you know uh, working for publishers after a while uh, it gets a bit difficult, and you you are, you would like to be able to plan holidays uh, more than six months in advance. Uh, it's difficult when you're living off of advances. So um, what I uh, realized is that uh, playing RPGs and even very basic old school Dungeons and Dragons can be a, a great breathing space. Um, you know, after after your week uh, on the Friday night, you spend four hours in a fantasy world and uh, you're feeling much better on the on the Saturday morning and even on the uh, on the spot. But if you would play, and that's what I've been doing in a co-working space where, where I've been for the last uh, uh, couple of years, maybe, if you were to play um, a very simple explore the dungeon, um, avoid the dragon, steal the treasure treasure uh dnd type game at lunchtime uh you will see that everyone is going to end up uh whatever the, the problems and the challenges and the stress they're they're getting during their during their morning they'll start their afternoon like with a lot of energy and it will also interact with each other so um my thinking is that was that you can go into big uh, tech companies and tell the employers of a lot of nerds who wouldn't go easily towards other people that they don't know in their company uh, and tell them, listen, I'll take the nerds, give me an hour, I'll bring them back to you. They'll be more productive and they'll be happier and they'll have to rob the dragon in the meantime. So yeah, that's what I've been doing here in Dublin and uh, at the moment, I'm not because there's no offices uh, working, but I'm um, I'm working on a on a on an online version, which is just as easy to organize. Um, yeah, there, there might be. De I I can imagine there's demand for that because it turns out my wife, uh, she works in a music publishing company, and it's been a couple of years. They already had a Slack room where they discussed about board games, and so a few people there were aware of Dungeons and Dragons. Either they were playing separately or people it was mentioned and and with COVID-19 because of the situation they actually started their game so now they uh, every Wednesday uh, there's a group from from that uh, business who's playing Dungeons and Dragons together as a, a way to to socialize uh, away from the the water cooler and the coffee machine 
So yeah. I, I can imagine in those times when people are working from home and a bit far away, it's it's a much welcome kind of team building, you know, social event. I I was never, I'm never happy with, that's one of the few things I'm not uh, keen on adopting in the UK is that the social of workplace is often at the pub after the office. Yeah. And I always lament not to have lunches like uh, when I was working in France or, or Belgium because when it's it's dinner time, it's after, after work, I want to go home. <laughs> I don't want to stay mm. thing uh, first. And second, I need it at home. And third, uh, I'm not a big drinker. And yeah, a pub is a terrible place to have a conversation, I find, personally. Yeah. So yeah, long story oh, short, right. I, I think you could find a, a lot of people interested in your offer. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, of uh nerd or or people who work in tech who don't like drinking um so and that's uh, that's the thing that's happening in the, in the uk but it's also happening a lot in in ireland is that as soon as you think about some kind of social activity activity is going to be uh, around drink maybe it's going to be in a cocktail bar for a change but uh, it's uh... still a lot of people are not interested in that I d I don't want to to sort of support stereotype, but uh, I did uh, go for a, a language exchange in Ireland and and uh, when I was a teenager. And what I found out when I was there is, was that it's quite fascinating compared to the the drinking culture in in Belgium, where people do drink a lot. Uh, I found it fascinating in Ireland. It seemed to be people were either drinking quite a lot. Or they were they were they were not drinking at all. Uh, it's it, it was very uh, there was this very strong um, dichotomy between people rather than most of the people being laid back about drinking. Not not really in Belgium. People don't really binge drink as much as they do in the UK or or Ireland, as far as I know. But at the same time, very few people are dry, and in Ireland it would be always the one or, or the other. Yeah, and um, there's um, there's a little bit of a stigma as well if you're not drinking. Like, uh, if you're a woman, you're probably pregnant, and you don't want to say. Uh, so um, yeah, it's 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 been evolving in the right direction, uh, to be honest. You you mentioned to me that you you were supposed to run something this morning, uh, and sadly you had to cancel. What are you running at the moment? Um, so it, it's part of my experience to, uh, or my experiment, sorry, to uh, try and do a lunchtime game with, uh, with people online. Uh, I could have picked uh, one of the adventures I have here, uh, take uh, one of the numerous uh, easy systems I have here, or Macchiato Monsters, but no, I decided to make a new uh, rule system and uh, to develop a, a world i had an, a, the idea of i have the map of uh, on my wall just here uh, for years and i never found the time or motivation to to do this so now i'm doing both wow. uh, <laughs> it's a simple the rules are one page and they're done so that's that won't take three years this time uh but the world is uh, evolving and it's called goblinburg Oh, cool! It's it's a city of goblins. It's a city of all goblins, wow. and uh, it's in uh, it's called, also called the Anti Spire because it's a gigantic stalagmite uh, <laughs> hanging from the cave, uh, the, the the ceiling of a cave somewhere very deep under the earth, under our earth, uh, in the 17th or 18th century. I haven't decided. So it's not uh, it's not you don't have a thing against uh, Chris Taylor and Grant Owit. The entire Anti Spire is not a, a rejection of their own game spire no no and i i, I uh what was the grand scheme uh about goblins that i have that i can't remember the name of but i uh yeah what uh, was it called uh, where where you play you you play six, six goblins and uh every time you you miss a roll one of them dies <laughs> uh and there's probably more than six goblins because uh Otherwise, you wouldn't play the whole game. Kind of a, a tunnel, yeah. uh, a funnel, so Goblin Quest. Goblin Quest, yeah. A, a game of maybe fit, fit <sighs> competence. Yeah, uh, I never got to uh, to run or play that game, but I really like the concept. Uh, 
But no, it's an anti-spire because it's a, it's a stalagmite and uh, I think anti-spire uh, sounds better. Uh, and everyone is a goblin there. Uh, even dwarves, they're called bearded goblins and uh, surface goblins are probably humans and uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> So uh, the, the idea is that you can come and play with any character that's Dungeon Dragon based or from a Dungeon Dragon centric game, uh, and uh, the system will accommodate you, and you will go on a quest to uh, find uh, a flying wig or uh, something equally stupid, uh, or maybe uh, change the government because uh, the the Sultan is uh, actually a bastard, and uh, some people want to. So, on their, on his head. So Sorry. does does this other system focus on something different than uh, Macchiato Monsters? Uh, what what was the motivation for starting afresh? Um, simplicity, really, because uh, even simpler Mac than Macchiato Monsters. Then, yeah, uh, it's one page rules. Uh, you don't need stats. You roll two d six. Uh, it's mostly. Um, games master decides uh, according to what you tell the games master about your character if you're going to be uh, good or bad at uh, the task you're attempting so uh, they give you uh, a role to uh, to do on 2d6 and uh, yeah that's all uh, hit points damage uh, magic will work but you have to roll in case you roll a really bad roll and then magic uh, turns against you and it uh, it makes for a nice twist in the story and uh, yeah, something very, really, really simple because I wanted anyone to play and I have a friend who plays with her two, two of her kids, like a, a six year old and 10 year old. I got the three of them on one, uh, on one uh, uh, screen and then I have uh, other players and they manage to play as well. Well, it's just, you just have to, uh, to make sure they don't chat too much and uh, the boy isn't uh, miming the attacks he does in the background. Uh, but it works like, it. yeah, it's all age, all levels of nerdism. Uh, and the challenge is more like putting an episode in an hour, basically. Yeah, it's a very tight uh, format. That's, that's I mean... what is still, uh, that's the, the, the work I still have to do. It doesn't work all the time. I'm asking to the chat room if they have any questions. Guillaume asked us if we can speak French. I already answered to him that we can, but we won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was I about to say? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was saying I, I was developing my own, my own game. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, what's your game about? So uh, it's... Um, so it was inspired by uh, a very quick read, not a thorough read. My my wife was reading a book called uh, Marie Kondo, the the life changing magic of tidying. Since mm -hmm. then, Marie Kondo's got a show, I believe, on Netflix or somewhere else. So she she's a slightly yeah. more famous. She's this. Uh, uh, well-being advisor uh, from Japan. Uh, she she seems incredibly nice, and uh, I think she she's got a point uh, about what she says about hoarding. But when I read her book and discussed it with a friend, uh, I thought it was uh, there was an immense potential for parody into that because if you if you took some of, some of her statements again, which makes sense, but slightly switch the context of them especially if you put it in a fantasy setting uh they i thought they were really hilarious so from that i, I created a, another character uh, uh, multi planner uh, well-being advisor living in a monastery called paris gondo uh, who they left behind them uh even their gender because uh, as marie kondo herself uh advice uh, you should look at things, and if they don't make you happy, you should throw them away. So that 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 individual look at their gender, so it didn't make them happy. So they threw it away. Uh, they, yeah. I think they, they probably did so with their even their flesh and their their body. So they're probably not just a spiritual being now. But the, the whole point uh, of the game was uh, 
sort of a take on the you know the the tropes and the failings of inventories in role-playing games, especially medieval fantasy uh, or role-playing games. And, oh, how much can I carry? I've got that much slot, or it's too heavy, it's that much uh, pounds of material, I'm not supposed to carry that. So so on one hand, it's, it's, it's quite simple, it's not too complicated, it's heavily narrative, it's mostly, the game is mostly prompt for people to, to goof and role-play, but the, this part of the game which is almost intentionally a bit tedious <laughs> because you're gonna have those the, the whole point of the game is that you've got a starting inventory of objects which are cards and they got stats mm -hmm. uh describing of course not only how useful they are and how heavy they are in your load but also or or how far is your potential emotional attachment to them because again if you see something doesn't make you happy you should throw it away and as Marie Kondo her se her se says herself uh, for instance at home you should have a stone which reminds you of your mother so <laughs> so the, the idea for instance of the stone in the game would be and th there's a character who's got that he's got uh, the wizard's got a unreadable tablet which is very heavy to carry around which is completely useless but uh, to which he, he's got a, a big uh, emotional attachment. And the, the whole point of the game is you're going to create new items, rolling their stats, making up what they are with a crazy explanation. Uh, we had, uh, what did we have yesterday? We had a magical harmonica. We had a clerical tiara. Uh, we had bracers coming from uh, a famous grandmother who was called the Breakers of Chains. Uh, because she, people are not sure if the because and that's that's sort of the the explanation we came up in in play yesterday. So the those strength bracers came from this grandmother who was very famous as the breakers of chains. But people are not sure if she was called that because she freed people like slave, or if she just broke chains. And we even in the, a cir in a circus. Yeah, and and like the player went yeah. even further saying, yeah, actually. Uh, cyclists didn't like her she's famous because cyclists didn't like her because she would break the chains of their cycles <laughs> so yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's you trade your your items and then you were you you're gonna have a few rolls and you're gonna find out based on what you kept whether you you're gonna survive the going back from the dungeon as a group where the, the game starts at the end of the dungeon you just defeated the the big boss and you find this treasure trove and that's where you 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 roll the loot but you need to go home, so will the group go home as a group? Then will individuals perish on their own because they hoarded too much stuff and they got caught in a trap or something? Again, the players came up, come up with the, the, the explanation. And finally, the most important thing, once you've managed to get out of the dungeon as a group and as an individual, you end up in a place and are you going to live a fulfilling and inspiring life or are you gonna be sad because yeah you survived but you left behind the stone tablet to which you were emotionally attached and and your you all your life you will have regrets uh, about that so and, and the players just make up the story based on the the prompts created by by the objects and the stats and so on and uh yeah uh I'm, I'm, I'm so it's a really cool idea um I, I need you to, yeah, to join the game once. Uh... Oh, yeah. I'd happily play and give you some feedback. But, um, yeah, we don't. Uh, there's there's always been a relationship, as you said, with uh, inventories and, and uh, items. You know, you have, uh, especially, I remember in my um, in my old uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons days. Yeah, I'm that old. Um, I have drawings of my character that I've played for years. Every time he got a new piece of equipment, I did a new drawing. And uh, it couldn't be a, a TV show character or, or even a comic book character because he changes appearance too often. Because, oh, uh, you know, the guy that looked really cool in the red uh, lacquered uh, armor uh, for years and years, uh, but then uh, he found the green one, and the green one is plus three, while the old one was plus two. Why Why am I going to uh, to keep that uh, armor that defined me as a, visually as a character? This one is plus three. My uh, armor class goes up. 
I'm not going to change that. And uh, you had all these characters that you have to re-describe every, every three or four sessions because, I don't know, I have a pointy hat uh, and it's much better at uh, making casting spells, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it was an interesting time in, uh, in Dungeons and Dragons that has probably changed, but we all have these lists and lists of, uh, of items uh, that define our characters in, for me, it was like a, a visual thing because I'm a visual thinker, but for a lot of players, it was just numbers, you know? Uh, what I'm I trying to- interesting to add, uh, What I'm trying to yeah, do with the game it, and uh, what I find interesting with, um, uh, you know, uh, contemporary smaller games is how they, they focus on, the, on an aspect of the, even if even if we just consider dungeon crawling, uh, a couple of days ago we had Grant Owit on Cafe Riz and we were discussing how, uh, for instance, Dungeon World is a simulator of Dungeons and Dragons, which try to reproduce a specific side of the experience of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so yeah, I think it's nice when you focus on a section of the the experience and you try to to max it out. And um, since since I started. On, on Paris Gondo, uh, I, I found out about another game, which is called You Meet in a Tavern. Uh, I think it might be a French game. Maybe it's a, it might be called uh, Vous Rencontrez Dans Une Taverne. But the the concept is that you just play the meeting in the tavern, but you're going to develop the whole yeah. story starting from there. But you, you, you don't leave the tavern. You just make up, okay, we meet and you've got a shady character in the corner and people engage with one another and it's a lot of improvisation improvisation stuff but you're not gonna do the dungeon actually you're just gonna work out a lot of rumors and and the, the parameters of the mission without actually doing the the mission i think it might be resolved with a few roles but uh yeah you just focus on that bit of the the experience yeah and that's something we have the luxury to to uh, to do. We were talking before when we we were offline and speaking in French because we can, but we won't. We won't. Uh, Sorry, Guillaume. <laughs> we won't. <laughs> Guillaume. Oh, by the um, way, I just realized Guillaume. Uh, it's Guillaume Janty who uh, is the designer of an excellent game I own but I haven't played yet. I believe that's him. Uh, called uh, Sonia and Conan versus the Ninjas. Uh, yeah, I so. know that game, uh, and and I know Guillaume because this you might see is the that's the the cover of Machiato Monsters Zero. Mm. Uh, so the the book we released before the game was finished, and that's Guillaume who made that. Uh, he uh, he has uh, quite a few uh, illustrations in, uh, in the new book now. I really need um, to try Sonia and the Ninjas. But uh, sorry, you were saying. Yeah. No, I, I want to play that as well. Um, I was saying that back in the day, we were thinking that games are um, are big and uh, all games have to be played in a campaign and uh, you can't find, you can, can't experience a, a game properly before you've played like 10, 20 games. Uh, but also, only one game, one session out of uh, maybe five or six is going to be a really good one because you have to interact with all these things and the game will sing only once in a while. And also you play for so long, you play six hours. You were not uh, that not kind before we started form. recording. We, you said one session out of 10, which I think is more <laughs> accurate. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, but what we, were, we, we said after that is that now we have uh, the... I don't know if it's if it's the wisdom or if it's the the height to uh, to look at what's been done for the last forty five years, but uh, we're able to focus on on experience of experiences that we really like and really want to reproduce, and then we make them into smaller games. But I don't think any of uh, your viewers are learning anything by what I'm saying here because <laughs> it's it's really. Uh, uh, Really obvious stuff, but um, I mean, there, there are a lot of resources it. now in a lot of shapes yeah. which we, we can use. They're available for people who are keen on on improving and 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 it's got the the mindset to to sort of yeah 
you know reflect and question the way they're doing things and uh, are they are they the right ones uh i guess it's yeah it's, it's i guess i don't know art might be like this like uh in stages in times in art history people would learn art by to some extent take paint and paint and they, they paint for 10 years and then they, they end up being a, a rather decent if not good painter but then at one point of history uh, and different times of history and places you start having uh, uh, yeah sort of schools of arts academics and they teach you techniques and you, you push your art further so in the process maybe you're losing something because if you look at art history then people people uh, yeah uh, techniques doesn't mean quality necessarily and things can uh, become samey also when you look at the the beaux arts in art history and so on at some point there's a question okay all this technique is great but uh, where's where's the passion where's the the talent the the individuality in in all of that yeah. but but still having those resources is is what the thing i mean you need both are i think uh, it's a it's a big argument uh, welcome to the intellectual time but you you need a both are to have a picasso and picasso is not a guy who who just did this thing and <laughs> it was random or jackson pollock those people were mm. were lectured and trained and they came to what they did uh, not because they started dripping paint randomly uh, at the at the frame, but because they they were uh, yeah genius. But they they came they still they still train and and studied a lot of stuff before doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nowadays, like back in the day, we had uh, magazines. That was the only way we could uh, communicate uh, between. It reminds me the first time I designers. the the first time and it was kind of mind blowing the first time I saw a piece of advice for game masters was uh, a or série uh, how do you call that in English uh, special edition of Spe Casus Casus yeah. Belli uh, the the French magazine and I still have it it's uh, the, the pages are flying away but uh, yeah it was the yeah the, the I don't know if it was the Galactic guy to to tabletop role playing, but it was full of good advice, and I think there was stuff from Gygax and even Monty Cook. It was like a compendium of uh, put in order or step by step of what you should do in role playing games. And but when I read that first, I was like, "Oh wow! I never thought about this and this and that." Yeah, yeah, role playing games are something you can you can you can play. You don't even have to know what the role playing game is, and you can play for the rest of your life. Uh, and then you can learn from other people and now you can watch people play for hours and hours and try and do the same thing as they do or decide that you don't like this bit and uh, you can try something else and it's super easy to get in touch with someone else and you can play from your own home with the people you admire so golden age right it's it's quite interesting I, i'm probably gonna have a, a panel about that uh, someday maybe maybe sooner than later but uh either in the case of actual play especially professional ones like critical role or uh, someone like yourself who offer a service uh, it's quite fascinating the idea that from the moment you offer a service or you're a professional entertainer uh, there's a uh, there's standards and performance levels which are expected you know if like if you're offering your your service of running games for a business, uh, it's not to some extent it's not acceptable that one out of ten of your the session you run is <laughs> actually interesting because people are playing and they might not be around out one out of ten uh, you know they, they might not be around for this one. The it's quite interesting how it yeah it it puts the the pressure on you to to deliver and that's when you you need to to start to think somewhat hard to what you about what you're doing i guess yeah um but also it's not the 90s anymore and we have the tools to make games that uh work uh in a better way you can adapt them to the people you play with and um you can make sure that you deliver something that's going to work more like 99 out of 100 times 
uh, I don't get feedback at every session, but uh, and I probably don't get the 99% uh, efficiency, but uh, I'm, I'm closer to them to that that uh, than uh, to the one out of 10 that we were talking about in the 90s. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 different. Like in a lot of things, shift as soon as you're charging money, um, and it's it's still a hot issue with a lot of people. Um, but you know, running, making games, and running games is a lot of work. And uh, it is, yeah, it's definitely. like it's it's like food. You know, you can spend the, your day uh, making a meal for your friends and be happy. Uh, to have them, but uh, you don't expect the restaurant to uh, be for free. Yeah, yeah, and it's not because the restaurant exists that people are st stopped cooking for their friends. But uh, yeah, if you're yeah. in a restaurant, consistency is expected from uh, from you to, to some level. Yeah, uh, I would love to continue chat discussing, but sadly, or uh, my I need to wake up my son from his nap, otherwise he won't go to bed at a decent time tonight. Uh, do you have one final thing you wish to say or plug and where can people find you? Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, people will find the, the notices, but I'm at Surcapitaine, which is S-U-R and then Captain in French. Uh, we'll put it in the show word. notes. So it's cool. got the same problem with uh, my Twitter. It's too complicated to spell. Yeah, yeah, I went back to my French. I had a, an, an English uh, one that worked in English <laughs> a long time ago, but uh, I had to, I had to only have the one account. And uh, yeah, all my stuff goes there. I have a YouTube channel where we talked about Goblin Berg uh, recently with Didier, who's the, Didier Balisevic, who's the, uh, the illustrator. Cool. Because uh, I'm lucky enough to have really good uh, friends who are also really good illustrators. Uh, so there's going to be a uh, uh, that's going to be a book or a zine, um, uh, most probably, actually. So Goblinburg will not just be a service. It will also be something that people can play, gamers can play. Um, and yeah, that's all. Thanks a lot. It was great talking to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Hopefully I'll, if there is a Dragon Meat this year, and uh, yeah. Uh, if I'll people are, are just listening to the audio version, we are crossing our fingers very very hard to to all meet and uh, exchange a lot of hugs uh maybe all terminal hugs at uh, dragon meet 20 uh 20 this yeah. year it would be great i really love that place uh and it was it was a uh, heartbreaking not to be able to make it last year so oh yeah oh yeah i'll book my, my flight as soon as i can Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for joining, Eric. It was a, a complete pleasure. Thanks, uh, everyone. Thanks, Guillaume. And uh, what's his name? The other person. Oh, we got more people now. Commando the Root, Lurks, and Billy Kears who joined us in the chat room. Uh, thank you, people, thank for you. listening, watching this. If you like that, please consider checking uh, our main show, The Rollis Podcast, or The Rollis Present. Uh, I think they're quite good. Uh, tooting my own horn and if you like what we do consider joining our newsletter to be kept updated about everything we do including the game I'm developing and consider I'm doing this out of passion for the hobby but I do have expense and I could do more if I had more financial support especially in those times please consider visiting our Patreon where you will find 90, 80 or so uh, additional episodes of Café Rollis before all the episodes I recorded before I did that online that's it so thanks again eric and uh, goodbye everyone thank you thanks thanks a lot have a good day cheers bye